to God's house this morning and happy Independence Day. Uh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Uh, but times are changing, are they not? It seems like the sand is shifting and in these days, maybe more than ever in our lifetimes, uh, we need to cling to Jesus Christ and the doctrine and values of the church in these days. And uh, perhaps we can bring God's blessing on our country as we continue to pray for our leaders and our in Psalms. If you would stand for the reading of God's word, please. The first is in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. And these go along with our sermon text this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. But this is Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And then in Psalm 118, beginning in verse 21, I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. You know, uh, God's wisdom is not man's wisdom. It needs to be, but when we think for ourselves, it differs from what God tells us is the truth. And the one who came and was rejected, God made chief over all. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. We don't have them on the screen this morning, but I've decided I'm going to read them to you anyway. And the Apostle uh, Peter says a whole lot in a very few verses. I'd like you to hear the words before I preach on them. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, and this is a verse I read to you earlier from Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, elect, chosen, precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special or peculiar people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You know, life uh, can get awfully busy and hectic at times. There's a lot of things, even if there are no huge problems in front of us that we have to keep up with to make it day to day. It's kind of like the woman that I read about in Reader's Digest one time. She went to her dental hygienist, and the hygienist was scraping the woman's teeth and said, do you spend at least four minutes at a, a brushing and flossing each time that you uh, brush your teeth, and with a gurgling tube hanging out of her mouth and over her lip, the woman responded, a little less than that. And she said, well, you really should, the hygienist said, or you will lose your teeth. And the woman vowed to herself to floss and brush and rinse as instructed, and she wrote it down on her list. A few days later, the woman went to her annual physical examination at which the doctor asked, how often do you exercise? And do you limit your salt intake? And does your diet contain too much cholesterol? So the woman decided that she would begin an intensive diet and fitness program that she checked off each day on her personal maintenance schedule that was mag with a magnet to the refrigerator door. Then the woman made an appointment for a beauty makeover, and the cosmetologist asked her, when is the last time you had a facial? And never did it seem like a very good answer. So the woman said, well, it's, it's been a while. To which the cosmetologist said, well, you should have a facial more often. You've already got some wrinkles and crow's feet around your eyes. So the woman went to her personal maintenance list and added, 
get facial. Then uh, she learned that personal maintenance was not all that she had to worry about. She was at the appliance repair shop trying to get her coffee maker fixed, and the technician asked her and said, do you run uh, white vinegar through it each month to clean it? And uh, she went home and started a home maintenance schedule, stuck it on the refrigerator right next to her personal maintenance schedule. And then several other appliances need care, not to mention her home and her vehicle as they began to demand attention. And she learned that the drives on her computer had to be cleaned, and the drive on her DVD player had to be cleaned, and the drive on her CD player had to be cleaned. And she began to wonder how long she could keep up this new rigorous program of attending to all the needs of life. She was already only sleeping four hours a night. She had lost touch with her husband and her children. She had no social life, not to mention there wasn't any more room left on the refrigerator door. <laughs> and it all came crashing down one night when on top of all this, she read an article entitled, Are You Endangering the Lives of Your Loved Ones by Failing to Dust Your Smoke Detector Alarms Regularly? <laughs> and so she ran to the refrigerator and she tore the personal maintenance schedule and the home maintenance schedules to shreds and in their place she established a new policy. She decided that from now on she was going to respond to all questions about her behavior and actions by just claiming the fifth. <laughs> Sometimes our modern lives uh, feel like that and a whole lot more. And when it gets like that it's easy for us to lose sight of our priorities. When we're under pressure, we tend to focus on whatever is due right now or past due or whatever is most, whatever is most time sensitive or urgent instead of focusing on what is most important. And it's good occasionally, even regularly, to remind ourselves or to be reminded of who our God is and of who we are, what our identity is, and what our priorities are or should be as the people of God. The believers in his day to whom the Apostle Peter wrote those verses, they were under pressure, pressure from severe persecution, and yet they still had to deal with the everyday things of life too. They were, as he told us in chapter 1, scattered as aliens in a pagan world. And it would have been very easy for them to lose sight of their priorities as the people of God. And if they did that, it could drive a wedge between the Jewish members and the Gentile members of the church, and it could threaten the life and the vitality and the unity of these new churches. And so the apostle wanted them to see their God and to see their identities as the people of God and what their responsibilities were as the people of God so that they would be able to focus on what was important and fulfill the glorious purpose to which their God had called them. And so the Apostle Peter closes the first major section of his letter by showing them and showing us that we are to live out our salvation by building our lives on Jesus Christ, keeping Christ central. By living in Christian community, meaning that we're being built up together, not just as an individual, but us together. And by witnessing to the world, proclaiming Christ's excellencies to others. And when we do these things, which are our responsibilities as the people of God, it helps keep us focused on Jesus when the pressures and the busyness and the complexity and life's demands on us just ramp up sometimes out of our own. So I want to start with who God is and that he is our rock, the living stone. Uh, you know, we had a rock long before we even knew who Dwayne Johnson is. We have a much more powerful and lasting rock than that. And we've got to keep God central in our minds and lives and literally, day by day, build our lives upon Jesus Christ. Our relationship with God must be at the center of all we do as individual believers and as the church together. Let me put it another way. If God is not our center, then we are off track altogether. Uh, if our devotion to him is lacking, then we are just playing at being Christians. You'll recall that 
the Lord rebuked the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. And it was a pretty good church. They were hard workers, and Jesus acknowledged that they were hard workers. They had persevered through trials and not grown weary. They had stood for the truth of the gospel against the false teachers who had come in their midst. They were doctrinally sound. And all of that was very commendable. In fact, in many ways, that church at Ephesus was far ahead of the modern church today. And yet the Lord said, but I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Because loving God and having God should be at the very center of our lives. Why should it be? Because Jesus Christ is our rock. He is our living stone, our sure foundation, that headstone, the chief cornerstone. And in these verses it says that Jesus is the elect of God, the chosen of God, and that he is precious to God. And the very first few words says that we have come to him, come to this living stone in salvation, and we have trusted in him. But what the Apostle Peter is trying to get at right there is not coming to him initially in salvation, but that after we've come to him initially in salvation, that we keep on coming to him repeatedly, daily in communion, and that we were come to come to the Lord again and again and again, and actually literally, actively build our lives upon him. Again, why? Because the Lord is our rock, our sure foundation. The Apostle Peter calls Jesus Christ a living stone, and that kind of grabs our attention because we don't normally think of stones as alive. That Jesus Christ is a stone means that he is our sure and solid foundations on which we are to build our lives. And that he is the cornerstone of the church means that he is the very foundation of the church. It means that everything else rests on Jesus. Everything else is built on Jesus, including our very lives. And that Jesus is the only solid, sure foundation for time, that short period of time that we live here, and for eternity. And what it tells us is this. And there are not many things like this. In fact, in terms of eternity, this is the only thing like this. That we can put our trust in him and know for certain that we will not be disappointed for having done so. It says that we will not be put to shame. And that Jesus is not just a stone, the solid foundation, that he is the living stone, meaning that he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead, triumphant over sin and death and hell, and that he is the author and giver of life, and that he is able to give spiritual rebirth and life to all people who will believe in him. Uh, Christian faith is not a religion of just going through dead rituals. It is a vibrant relationship with the living Lord of all creation. And so we come to him, and we relate to him, and we commune with him daily, and we build every single thing in our lives on who he is and on what he has provided for us in his death and in his resurrection. So we build our lives on Christ by believing in him and by obeying in him. And I want you to notice in these verses that people who believe are the ones who obey, and the people who, re who reject are the ones who disobey. So it's not just thinking, it's doing involved in this, because one, our doing follows from our thinking. If we believe, we obey. If we don't believe, we disobey. And uh, only the people God, of God do the things of the people of God. The people of God don't do the things of the world we're not supposed to. And the people of the world don't do the things of God. Uh, so we build our lives in, on Christ by believing in him and by obeying him by actually living for him. To do that, you and I have to let go of our own works as the way to be right with God and not trust in ourselves and what we do as the right way to approach God. Instead of all that, we rest completely on who Jesus Christ is and on what he has done for us when he died on the cross in our place. And you know, you'd think that would be the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's not easy for people to do. To rest completely on God and what he has done 
and his grace to us. And once that we come to him in salvation that way, and then once we have trusted in Christ as our Savior, then the Christian life becomes a process of discovering by personal experience all that he is to us. It becomes a process of knowing him and knowing him more. Uh, the Apostle Peter will write, we'll see when we get to it in 2 Peter, uh, that God has granted us to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, meaning that Jesus is absolutely our sufficiency. He doesn't have to be added to. Uh, he is our all in all. And as we build our lives on him, as we do that, and as we continue to commune with him by faith, we learn, we come to a knowledge, we come to an understanding that our primary need in life is to know Jesus Christ, is to know him, our living stone. So I'm going to tell you like it is this morning. If you are not consistently taking time, to continue to come to the living stone in personal devotion and to literally build your life on him as he is revealed to us in his word, then your priorities are wrong. See, I know I'm taking a risk there because you can't tell anybody today that they're wrong about anything. You know, everything is equally right these days, but that just unfortunately is not true. In fact, we together, all of us together as his church, if we do not keep Jesus Christ at the center by continually coming to him and all we do, then our priorities as a church are wrong. Uh, what that means is, like we just sang in the offertory, that if we're not doing that, we're just building a work on sand. If I'm not building my life on the rock, I'm building my life on sand. Uh, sand shifts. Sand Sand is not very stable uh, unless you get deep enough, I guess. And what these verses are saying is that Jesus Christ is choice. He's chosen by God, precious in God's sight. And what that means is that he should be choice and precious to us also. Because he's our living stone, our solid rock, sure foundation for time and for eternity. That's who our God is. He's not puny. He is not weak. He is not insignificant. He is uh, the biggest thing going. He's the most magnificent thing that could that exist. And he exists eternally. And he wants to know us and for us to know him. He wants us to be with him. And he's provided a way for that to happen. And that way is our living stone. Not a dead stone. A living stone. So that's who our God is. So let's talk about for just a minute who we are as people of God, people of the rock. Um, if I wanted to take a theme and just preach about our identity in Christ, uh, I could preach that theme the rest of my days. I don't think we realize who we are in Jesus Christ. Uh, when the living stone showed up, some people rejected the living stone. In some versions it will say disallow of the living stone. And the apostle identifies these people as the disobedient ones. To them, Jesus was a stone of stumbling over which they stumbled. And to them, Jesus was a rock of offense by which they were offended. And they are still in the darkness. Those who reject the living stone and disobey him have not obtained mercy. And I'm trying to stick to the language in these verses 4 through 10. But even though the living stone has been rejected by many, he was chosen of God. He was precious to God. He was elect by God. And so God made him the chief cornerstone in Zion. This was something God did. It was God's doing. And we who have come to him by faith and who have put our trust in him, and then we who continue to come to him, to commune with him day by day so that we might know him, we who are the obedient ones, it says that we also are living stones. Living stones that he is building up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, uh, meaning a people for his own possession, and as the people of God, where we formerly didn't have it, now 
We have obtained the mercy. That's our identity. That's who we are. We're not who we were. This is who we are and who we are becoming. And we're going to get to it in a minute. While he might be doing that in me individually and you individually, he is also doing that in us all together in a corporate identity. Okay, hang on to that for just a minute. So now, if we are a holy priesthood and a royal priesthood, we've got some pro uh, responsibilities as priests. We've got some priestly functions, some priestly duties that we are to perform. And the apostle identifies two of those priestly duties for us. One of them is that we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, this keeps the Lord central in our lives. We come to Jesus, the living stone. We continue to come to him. And as we do that, he is building us up a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices. And that is the doctrine that we know as the priesthood of all believers. It's not just Levites who are priests. It's not just Jesus who is our high priest. We have now become priests of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, only Levites were priests. And it was only the Levites that could physically draw near to God and offer up sacrifices and burn incense on his altars. And then only the high priest could, once a year, enter the Holy Holies where God resided, the presence of God resided, and atone for people. That's how it worked. But now, Jesus Christ, our high priest, has offered himself once and for all as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And when he did that, now we have direct access to God. We have become believer priests with direct access to God, direct access to the presence of God through Jesus Christ, our mediator. What that means is that I don't need an Old Testament priest to be able to come to God. And I don't need a New Testament priest to be able to come to God. And I don't have to make a bloody sacrifice of an animal to come to God. We just need Jesus Christ through whom we have access to the Father. And as priests, we don't offer animal sacrifices, but now we offer other sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices. What spiritual sacrifices do we offer up? Well, in Romans 12, 2, it tells us to offer our bodies as living, not dead, living sacrifices to God. And that means that everything that I do now, every action I take, can be or should be done to God's glory as a sacrifice unto Him. Everything. Even daily things. Even mundane things. Even routine things. In Romans 15, 16, Paul says that he was ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that his offering of the Gentiles would be acceptable to God. So when we share the good news to those who are still in darkness, we are offering a sacrifice up to our God. In the Philippian church, they took up an offering. That was a very poor church. They took up a collection and they sent it to Paul so that his needs would be met. And Paul calls their giving, their service, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So when we give, it is a sacrifice unto God. In Hebrews 13, 15, and 16, it says through Christ that we are to continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So when we praise him, when we do good, when we share, these are sacrifices that as the people of God we offer up to God. Now all of that, relates to our Christian lives now. Because everything that we do, the way we live, should be a thanks to Jesus Christ. It should be a thank offering to Him. So uh, let me ask you, do you teach a class? Or do you usher? Or do you prepare food when we're together uh, for fellowship? And do you clean? Or do you arrange tables and chairs? Or cut grass? Or call on the sick, or take meals to the sick, or give money, or sing, or pray, or give godly counsel to people? Uh, well, let me say this. Whatever you do, and all that you do, should be done as a sacrifice offered up to Jesus Christ. You ought to do it with a right mind, and a right heart, and a right motive, saying, Lord, is this pleasing to you?
I've told you the story, but I'll tell you again. When I was at Sidey Daisy, I had a uh, minister of music. Um, he was originally from New York, and he was about six seven. He's a great big guy <clears throat> and really talented, a good musician and a good choir leader. Uh, but he had a New York kind of attitude, you know, and uh, sometimes that just got a little out of control. And uh, one day he came in. His name was Kevin. He came into uh, my office. We had two services in the morning, and uh, he was just fit to be tied and in a knot, and you know, mad at the choir because they hadn't done this, and you know, blah 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 blah. And I listened to it for a minute. It's not the first time that it occurred, but I was intending for it to be the last time that it ever occurred. <laughs> and so when he came in, he did all that. I said. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I want you to do. His car was directly, I see outside my office window looking at his car. I said, I want you to go out and get in the car and just go home. He said, we got two services in just a minute. I said, I know. Be fine. I said, we'll sing uh, without you. And if the piano player doesn't want to play, then we'll sing without music. And I said, we're going to worship one way or the other, wherever uh, huge it is or however meager it is, we're going to worship. And I don't want you to come back and lead anything until you tell me that the only reason you're doing it is for Jesus Christ, because you love him. And when you can do that, we'll talk about it. And if you can't do that, you won't be leading anymore. He was a volunteer, by the way. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, you're serious. I said, yes, I am. And he lowered his head. And he said, sat there for a minute quiet, he said, I can do that. And I said, you need to make sure. I said, because we won't have the conversation again. You, know, you need to do it because you love Jesus Christ. You need to do it as a thank offering to him. And all the things you do in here, some of you are so faithful to do things, uh, we need to keep in mind why we do things uh, unto the Lord and for the Lord. And everything that we do now should be a thank offering to him. Lord, does this please you? Because your motive is not to be seen and recognized by people. Your motive is out of love for and gratitude to and sacrifice unto the Lord. So the people of God are a royal, holy priesthood who offer up spiritual sacrifices to God, and that's part of our duty and privilege as priests of God. Amen? Amen. You know, if you ever get tired and weary, if you ever feel like you're, you know, uh, the only prophet sitting under the juniper tree, uh, you need to, and we do sometimes, we need to back up and look around and get our perspective right again. So that's one of our duties as a priest. The other one that Peter identifies is that we are to show forth, proclaim, declare, make known the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, we forget this, too. So listen, I want to remind this. God has called us out of the world to be his own special people so that we can go back into the world living as his people here to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So when we gather together as his church for worship, that's what we're doing. We're proclaiming, we're declaring his praises, his excellencies to one another, and we build up one another in the faith. We do that while we're here. okay? And then when it's over, we leave here and we go back into the world. Peter says scattered in the world. And we proclaim God's mercies and we proclaim God's light to those who are still in the darkness. We've already been here with each other, see? We're here getting filled up. This is a filling station. And we leave here, we're going to go out and we're going to expend all that we've been filled up with trying to tell people in darkness that there's a light that they can walk in that is far better than being in the darkness. Thanks to Jesus Christ. That's what priests of God do. That's what little living stones under the living stone do as priests. Now, it would be great uh, if when we do this, that everybody who doesn't know the Lord, when we try to witness to them, it'd be fantastic if they were, man, I didn't know that, and they were excited, and they responded positively, as if they were just waiting for somebody to tell them so that they could hear and believe. Uh, some are. 
But the Bible is clear that we can expect rejection and opposition to the gospel and to us. Now the temptation is for us to tone down the gospel message to make it more pleasing, more acceptable, less offensive, to lower the bar as low as possible so that people will not reject it and not reject us. In fact, the modern church has gone out of its way to present an unoffensive Christ to the world. I believe that's a mistake. I believe it is a mistake. Uh, Jesus today is often preached and marketed as a nice, non-judgmental man who would not upset anybody on purpose, not make anybody feel bad about themselves, and who will gladly meet every person's every need and desire, that he will make them feel good about themselves, and that he will make them to be successful in whatever endeavor they choose. Uh, that is not the Jesus who is revealed in the Bible. Okay? Uh, let me say this, be careful to say this, we should not be rude. We should not use evil methods. We should not be insensitive to people when we share the gospel and seek to make Christ known to people who are still in the darkness. And we should not, as a rule of thumb, just absolutely blast people with God's judgment. Jesus was kind to sinners, although not always to some Pharisees and Sadducees. Yet, he spoke plainly to them about their sin and about judgment. So we should always listen to people, not to sin. To people, we should always be gracious. And we should always tell the truth. Uh, that's a tightrope sometimes. But we have to do it. It says in Colossians 4, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech be seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. And when we go with good intentions, being gracious, but telling the truth, we should always remember that the Christ revealed to us in the Bible, listen folks, will offend many people. It will offend many people because the cross is offensive. The meaning of the cross humbles human pride. The cross tells people that they are not good enough and can never be good enough to get into heaven on their own. The cross tells people that they are sinners in need of salvation, and many people don't like that. Many people find that offensive. Also, Christ's lordship offends people. They like the idea of Jesus being some kind of Aladdin's genie who can be summoned at our will and is required to fulfill all of our wishes, all of our wants, and all of our desires. People like that notion. But a Christ who is Lord, a Christ who confronts sin and who demands obedience and has every right to command us. That's another story. So I want to tell you that if you proclaim Christ crucified and if you proclaim Christ as Lord, some will believe and be saved and others, probably the majority, will reject Jesus and reject you personally. So be prepared. And the dividing line is belief versus unbelief. Believing or not believing in Jesus separates people into two distinct groups. In fact, it's the only designation that really matters. Uh, slave nor free is not the issue anymore. Uh, Jew or Gentile is not the issue anymore. Rich or poor is not the issue anymore. Saved or unsaved. Believers, and this is using the Apostle Peter's verses, we are joined to God and joined to other believers in Jesus' marvelous light. And in that light, we together are being built up into something extremely special. Believers fulfill the function of priest, offering up spiritual sacrifices, proclaiming the excellencies of the Lord. Believers have obtained mercy, and one day believers will be exalted with Jesus Christ. But unbelievers, those who do not believe, those who do not repent, those who do not obey, remain in the darkness, headed for God's judgment. And Jesus Christ, make no mistake, Jesus Christ is the central issue in belief or unbelief. He's the cornerstone in whom a person puts faith. He's the cornerstone 
on which a person builds his or her life. Or he is the stumbling, stone of stumbling and the rock of offense over which a person falls. He's one or the other. So every person who lives in darkness can come into the light through Jesus Christ. And as believers, as the Lord's priest, we are to proclaim to him, him, to those in darkness. That's our priestly function. That's our privilege as believers. The people of God are a royal, holy priesthood whose function is to offer up spiritual sacrifices and to proclaim his excellencies to those who are still in the darkness. Okay? Let me get one last thing out of these verses. And that is the idea of our corporate identity, that we are together. I've had just this week two or three different people who have some needs talk to me about how wonderful the church has been to them, meaning you, the people in the church, and how what a comfort it is to know that people are praying, and how great it is that somebody would care enough to come by or send a card or send food. And somebody specifically talked about Linda sending them CDs for uh, the sermons and how much they appreciated that. And uh, that is the church being the church to the church. You know, that is what we are supposed to do. And what the Apostle Peter is saying that we are all being built up together, not just alone, not just individually, but we all together are being built up by God. Now, people are saved one at a time as individuals. Each believer becomes a living stone under the headstone or built on the foundation of the chief cornerstone. And I want to tell you this as an individual. You are the church, but you're not the church alone. You're not a family of one. You do not live the Christian life by yourself in isolation. God is building up all believers together into something much greater than one. And the apostle wants us to see that while we each have a relationship with God, living the Christian life is not solely an individualistic thing, that we have a relationship with God and we have a relationship with each other. And together we are being built up into a spiritual house, into a temple of the Lord. You know, in our day, uh, I guess in some ways the world is becoming smaller because of communication technology. And the world's becoming smaller because of transportation technology. And we are sold the notion that uh, now we're just part of one global village. I don't really buy that, but uh, it's, it's offered to us. But the fact is that our society and people today are becoming increasingly fragmented and mobile and impersonal. You know, just as an example, if you're a fairly busy person, you probably have relatives that you haven't seen or meaningfully communicated with in years. I did. Um, it's not uncommon in this day for grown children to move thousands of miles away from their parents. With the phenomena of a high divorce rate, some children rarely see their own fathers or mothers. And the fact is that God has made us to be connected with other people and that built in us, no matter how much we push it down, we have a high felt need to be in community. And for the people of God, God has designed or ordained and given, in addition to families, the church to fulfill that need. Not all churches do. The church is a grace community to meet the need of being connected to other people. And God is building us up together, and that is felt in our lives. We see it, it's realized in our lives to the extent that every single believer exercises his or her priesthood under the headship of Jesus Christ. So if all of us in this room are priests and nobody's fulfilling the priestly functions. Then it's not going to be recognized in our lives, him building us up together to any great measure. It's not going to be all that perceptible, is it? But if everybody in here who is a priest by identity fulfills, offers up spiritual sacrifices, proclaims his excellencies, not only to those in the darkness, but to one another as we're together, 
then the realization that God is building us up into a special community is realized, but it has to happen. So if everybody is not as living stones being fitted together, being built together with all the other living stones on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, then the building is weaker, is it not? I mean, take this building here. If the builders had left out a few things, you know, a few stones here, a few stones there, Few cement block, this cement block walls behind the sheet rock. Right? Few cement blocks here, few cement blocks there. A little rebar here, a little rebar there. A little cement here, a little cement there. Raptor here, raptor there. Sheet roof and metal here, sheet roof and metal there. I wouldn't want to be in this building and stand under that roof, would you? Would you? If they had left out those things. Um, tragically, we've seen the collapse of the building in Miami. Uh, has cost so many lives, they've not identified the cause of the collapse yet, but I'll tell you this, the building's only 40 years old. Uh, that thing was not fitted together with all the parts right now. Couldn't have been. And that's like the church. If you are part of the church and you're attached to this local body, us together, and you are not being fitted in by God according to your function and your spiritual gifts, the whole building is weaker. Now, the church is not a building. It is the people of God. But Peter is using the example of a building to let us see how we're supposed to be being fitted in together. Uh, God is the designer. And here's the fact. You know, when we did bulletins, we used to put this on the bulletin. You are a minister. Every bit as much as I am. Now, I've got a calling uh, within the church to perform a certain role as pastor, but you are a minister too. You are a priest, and we are to minister to one another in the church as the people of God, and it's a mistake to think of your ministry only in formal terms like a position, like a, a Sunday school teacher or a head of a committee. These are ministries, but ministry literally is the overflow of Jesus Christ in your life to somebody else. That's what ministry is. And that he so fills our lives to the brim that he overflows and you minister to other And that's going to happen if Jesus is priority one in your life. Uh, you will minister to other people from him overflowing. And most ministry takes place through relationships. So we gather together as believer priests looking to build up one another because Jesus Christ is filling our hearts and lives to the brim as we continue to come to him. You see how these verses the Apostle Peter's given us fit together? Uh, there's one other way that God building us up together will be felt, will be recognized, will be seen, and it will be to the extent that we all live in line with, in accordance with, our identity as the distinct, peculiar, God's own people. So all of our identity that now exists, that is true, we still have to live out who we have become and live out who we really are. And that's why the apostle piles up terms and names and descriptions to paint a picture of our corporate identity, to paint a picture of who we are together as the people of God. And all the expressions he uses come out of the Old Testament. A chosen generation or race, Isaiah 43. A royal priesthood, Exodus 19. A holy nation, Exodus 19. A peculiar people, a people for God's own possession, Exodus 19. And then he refers to Hosea chapter 1 and 2 to remind his readers that Formerly, they were not the people of God, but now they're the people of God. And formerly, they have not obtained mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. Folks, he wrote all of this because his readers are in new, small, fledgling, scattered churches that are being very persecuted and to keep them from splitting apart and to keep the Believers from falling apart. They needed to see their identity as the people of God. And so they had come to the living stone who is chosen by God, who is precious to God, though he had been rejected by men. And they could expect that they too, though that they are choice to God and precious to God, that they also would be rejected by men in the short run. 
But in the long run, they would not be put to shame and they would share in Christ's glory and honor. Now, listen to this. This is important because a lot of you are under the gun. Maybe not because you're Christians, but you're a Christian under the gun for some, some reason. The way that we endure the way that we endure rejection, the way that we endure persecution, the way that we endure hardship is to see our new identity as the chosen people of God. Knowing that, living that, keeping Him central allows us to endure. And as we do it, we will be built up together to the extent, to the measure that we see this and live out our new identity in the Lord. Let me say it another way about this being built up together. God never intended that we live as Lone Ranger Christians. Uh, I mean, even he had Tonto, you know. And when you, if you get into a group of Christians not from your church, or uh, you're talking and people say, let's just go around the room and identify ourselves. You know, yeah, I'm Keith Bates, I'm from Lost Mountain Church of God. Somebody will say, uh, I'm a Christian at large. You know, I'm not really attached to any church. We, uh, I'm just a Christian at large. <laughs> Can I tell you this? There's no such thing as a Christian at large, biblically. Uh, that is uh, contrary to the Bible. Uh, it doesn't hold water biblically. It's a violation of biblical truth. There is no such thing. I want to be clear about this. All of us, all of us are to be connected to a local church with other Christians where the Lord is actively building us up together with other believers. And along with Jesus Christ being at the center of our lives, His church should be at the center of our lives. You know, back in old days, uh, from medieval times on probably to 1940, you come to a town and or a village in Europe, and there would be a church. Sometimes it was a Catholic church, but there would be a church, and it was the center of everything. You remember how uh, Israel, when they were mobile, before they got the promised land, the way they knew where to stop is the pillar of fire or the cloud quit moving. They said, oh, this is the spot. And the first thing they did was they oriented the tabernacle, okay, the tent of meeting. And then every tribe knew where to get around the location of the tent. And the tent that housed the presence of God was right in the middle. You see, everything was oriented around that, physically oriented around that. And then you get to villages, and the best building in town was the church. Uh, that's where the music was. That's where the art was. That's where the stained glass was. That's where somebody could read and write in those days. Okay. But it was the center of village. And people went home and they had an altar in their homes. And they made Jesus Christ and his church the dictating fact of who they were, how they lived, what they did, what their schedule was going to be. Do you see? And now we get to our day. And while there might be in the south a church on every corner, it's not the center. Of course, I wouldn't even know physically what the center is. You might say Atlanta, but I'm not sure I would say that. But um, Now we've got so many things. It's not just the crops competing for our attention. It's not just a sick family member competing for our attention. We've got a gajillion things every day that bombard us competing for our attention and our order. Jesus and his church are to be the center. And everything that we do should be unto him as a sacrifice. And all of our lives, as we continue to come to him, should be built on the chief cornerstone on whom the church, us, on whom we rest our very lives. Not an atom, not an extra, not if there's some, something left over, but the very core, the very center. And we have gotten away from that as a nation. And we have gotten away from that, many people, as the people in the churches. And we need to get back. We need to return to that because that is what God intends. Not to be lone rangers, but connected with others, being built up together 
and to something very special. So let me conclude with this. I want to ask each one of us this morning, as people of the rock, as the people of God, to examine our priorities this morning. And Vicki, I don't know how you did this. I hope you put them up one at a time. You did not, okay. That's okay. I'll wait to fix it. It's okay. Smile. It'll be all right. <laughs> uh, I've got some questions that I want you to, I'm going to give to you, and you can choose to ask yourself. I'm asking you. And I want you to be serious about the answers to these questions. First and foremost, have you and do you truly believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord? He has the right to command you, he ha and he does it in your best interest. Is Jesus and his death on the cross precious to you? Is Jesus the center of your life? Are you continuing to come to him daily in communion? Are you building your life on him? And are you offering your life as a spiritual sacrifice to him? Because if we don't get those things in the right place, none of, none of the other stuff will follow. But if we get those things in the right place, everything else will line up. Okay? And you have to answer those questions for yourself. Secondly, are you seeking, working at, are you available to be built up together with Jesus' people or are you do you just attend church? Um, I don't want to be brutal about that. But you can attend church, which is more than many do, and not really be fully engaged. You, know, you could attend church and not really be deep into the life the people of the church. You could attend church and Jesus Christ not be your center. So are you seeking? Are you working at being built up together? Are you available to be built up together with the people of God as he does this for us? And have you truly committed to this church and are you fully engaged in it? I'm going to tell you right now, if every single person isn't, this church won't be all it can be. So it will be living stones not fitted in. And finally, are you proclaiming his excellencies to those in darkness? See, all these other things are offering up spiritual sacrifices, but are you proclaiming his excellencies to those in darkness so that they too may come into the light? That's what the priest, that's what a royal priesthood does. That's what a holy priesthood does. That's what a holy nation of people under God do. So I'm going to leave you with those questions and this thought. These should be our priorities as the people of God who have now obtained mercy. And the fact that we've obtained mercy and the means by which we have obtained it, that should drive all these other things. If you just think about it, man, once I was in darkness, now I stand in the marvelous light. Once I wasn't the people of God, now I'm a child of God. Once I hadn't obtained mercy, I was dead in my sins. Now I've been forgiven and cleansed, and I've obtained mercy. That I couldn't manufacture, I couldn't create, and I couldn't grab. He gave it to me. And now everything is different. I have a new identity, a new spiritual birth, a new person. And now out of gratitude for him and all of that and love for him, you know, will we do anything that he asks us to do? Uh, because that, brothers and sisters, is the commitment that he demands. If you don't think so, uh, I can read those words to you again. One thing about 1 Peter and 2 Peter is, <laughs> you know, like be holy for I'm holy. There is no loophole. There's no wiggling room. There's no space to negotiate a lesser demand in these words. They say what they say. Okay. Now, um, I usually preach with the view 
that we want to examine our lives and if we've fallen short to repent and ask forgiveness and uh, step up to the plate. You know, and we should constantly examine our lives. But on the other hand, I also want to say that some of you do a fantastic job at this. Some of you are extremely committed. Some of you love Jesus Christ and that motivates you to do all that you do in life and for the Lord. And I want to applaud you and thank you for being an example and uh, for touching other people's lives. Now, get somebody and without telling them I'm going to mentor you, show them how to do this. Find somebody that life whose life doesn't appear to be like that and help them be like that because biblically that's who they are already that's their identity and we need to live up to our identities in Jesus Christ amen so we all none of us have arrived even the apostle Paul said in scriptures I've not yet arrived and so while we're still in the flesh, there's always gains that we can make, and that's always kind of my perspective, my viewpoint. But on the other hand, there's some of you that do an awfully good job at being a priest of Jesus Christ. And now we all need to be so that there's a solid building of living stones built on the chief cornerstone. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, there are some here today that would need to repent. Uh, I pray that in their hearts and in their minds that they will and that you will hear their repentance and be pleased with their offering, their sacrifice of repentance. And I pray that, again, you would cleanse and refresh, that you would let us start anew, begin again. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give a blessing and a sense of well-offness to those that are seeking to be all that they are in Jesus Christ. And that the rest would step up to that identity. And thank you for building us up together to be a spiritual house, a chosen generation, your own your people, the people of your own possession, and let us live like the sons and daughters of the Father that we really have. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and enjoy the holiday weekend.